Hello there and welcome back to another video here on Wrist Watch Revival. My name is Marshall. Thank you so much for coming along. Look at what we have on the bench this time around. I honestly can't even believe that I get to work on one of these. This is a very special watch. This is a Rolex Explorer from the late 1960s. This is a reference 1016. It's an absolute icon and it happens to be one of my favorite vintage watches in existence. This watch came to me though under not great circumstances. So I did a, a kind of a cool thing. I got to do a news story for a local news station here about this, about the channel and stuff. I'll actually put a link in the description if you wanna check that out. But as a result of that, I got contacted by a really nice lady named Annie who said, hey, will you take a look at my watch? It's not working. I had her send me some photos. I saw what it was and I said, okay, well, what happened? What, what was the story with this watch? And she explained to me that this watch belonged to her father. Now, unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago and he left her the watch. Now, this isn't running. And I asked her what had happened and she said that she went out to the beach, she was wearing it, and the crown wasn't screwed down all the way and she was doing some clamming and seawater got into the watch. This is, of course, pretty devastating uh, for a wristwatch, yet her dad, who you see here actually wearing the watch, bought this watch in Vietnam in the late 1960s and wore it every day of his life. He's wearing it there. He's wearing it there too after a triathlon. This guy seemed like he lived a very active life and he wore this watch for that life. So this is something, of course, that's extremely special to Annie because, you know, when, you, when she thinks of her dad, he was very proud of this watch. This was something that he bought himself and then he wore every single day. So obviously she was heartbroken when she realized that the, the seawater had gotten in and, and that the watch wouldn't run anymore. Now, what she did is she did the thing that you're supposed to do. She went down to the local jeweler that, that stocks Rolex and they told her, well, we don't have the expertise or the tools to the parts and stuff to fix this watch, but we'll send it to Rolex in Geneva. It got there and Rolex said no they aren't going to fix it either. And they sent it back to her. Now this is, you know, she was willing to spend whatever it would take to get the job done and nobody would work on this watch. So I was kind of her last resort. So what we have here is uh, a watch that is not only valuable monetarily, though it is definitely that as well. I mean, probably minimum price for a watch like this would be about $20,000. This one's worth more because it's kind of a special version, but that's not what she's interested in. This is valuable because this was her father's watch and he wore it. And she was, like I said, heartbroken that it wasn't working anymore. And I couldn't say no. Look, I, this watch is iconic. The story is amazing. And you and I, well, we're gonna work on this thing today and try to bring this watch back to life. First things first, we got to take the back off and see what's inside. Don't be too much rust. Oh, okay. Um, there is rust. That's bad. Let's see. Okay. It looks like the automatic winding work still turns. You can see the rust along the outside edge here. And yes, you can see some of the screws have completely rusted out as well. This could have been worse. Um, I'm not sure yet, but right now there is rust. There was definitely water in here. This happened almost a year ago. Um, again, she took it in to try to get it serviced right away, but, but nobody would work on it. So let's continue disassembling the watch and let's see what we find about, uh, how much damage is done. Um, you know, worst case scenario, we'd have to replace the whole movement. Just at first glance here, that doesn't seem to be the case, right? Like just taking a look, I mean, there's still at least some parts that look fine. But the fact that it's not running is pretty bad. So we'll start off with the case, the case screws. These screws on Rolexes are kind of interesting. They, they uh, push up against the case to hold it in rather than using clamps. I'm going to try to clear away a little bit of the rust here with my screwdriver and some Rotico just to see if I can maybe break the seal around the outside because on a Rolex movement, you actually have to turn the entire movement inside the case. Let's see if that worked. 
Uh, it's gonna bu okay, it's budging a little bit. Have to be careful here, but we do have some movement. So we have broken the, the rust seal on the outside. We have to keep turning it until the screws line up with the slot right there. And now we should be able to just drop the movement out of the case. Okay, so that's a good start. We have the movement out. And of course we have to be very careful and remove the dial. You can see more rust around the rim of both the dial a little bit, but mainly the inner part of the movement. We'll start, of course, by taking off the hands. Okay, the hands come off fine, so that's another good step for us moving forward. This is a very tense time uh, working on a watch like this that has rust damage. You just don't know what's going to stick and what's not. Now we can take off the dial. And it looks like, yeah, the dial screws are rusted pretty well also. We'll have to see if the dial's gonna wanna come off. This one came out, all right. Yeah, definitely rust on that. I'm using Rodico to just kind of clean up any debris. Let's see if the dial will come off now. A little tough. Okay, it did come away though, so we'll set that aside and we'll revisit that in a little bit. But for now, I'm happy just to have it removed. I'm less happy about what I see inside here though. That is a lot more rust. You see the keyless works is properly rusted. And okay, well, this isn't the worst news. So just some light rubbing with the tweezers does remove that rusting on the actual movement. It does not, however, here, you can see that that's a uh, more properly rusted and likely gonna need to be removed. And you can see there's rust just sort of coming out onto the work surface here. This is, um, well, uh, what I would say at this point is this is not the worst case scenario, but it's definitely not the best case scenario. So we'll start by removing the automatic winding works. This whole module on the top is responsible for winding the watch when you move your hand around, but we can just remove the whole entire module. We'll take that apart separately. And underneath, hey, this is actually pretty good news. It looks like the balance wheel doesn't have rust on it, and same with at least what we can see on the top of the movement. Let's take off the, the balance and see how it looks, because that balance spring is so tiny. If it gets rusted, it's just done. Uh, you, you have to replace it at the minimum. But we'll see right now. Oh, that looks good. Okay, that actually looks very good. Okay, so the balance looks like it didn't get any seawater on it. And now we can take off the ratchet wheel, which also looks like it dodged any of the seawater. This whole upper part of the movement doesn't look like it was affected. It looks like it was, the water came in through the crown and went to the keyless works, which makes sense, that's the next stop, but also made its way into the middle of the watch. We saw the cannon pinion on the other side looked like it had uh, quite a bit of rust, but it looks like it may not have, the water may not have gotten through all the way to the other side of the movement. And if that's the case, that could be really good for us. I'm gonna use my cannon pinion remover. Okay, it took that right off, so that's good. Although I can see that it's rusted underneath. So yeah, it looks like the water made it through there to the uh, to the center wheel as well. So we'll see how that looks like when we get the rest of this part off. This is a, a phase where we're very much trying to assess how much damage is done and what needs to be replaced, what can be fixed. When I talked to the owner, she told me, um, you know, that she would prefer to keep as much of it uh, original as possible, right? This is the watch that her dad wore every day. So you'd like to have as much of that original as you can. That makes sense. But of course, you know, not at the expense of having it not run. 
Okay, we can take off the crown wheel now and everything looks fine here. And that's a relief because those crown wheel screws are very, very small and it's very easy for those to, to rust out and then it's extremely difficult to even get them out of the movement. Okay, now we can take off the click and the click spring. Again, working our way through the top of the movement, this part seems to have, for the most part, dodged the seawater, which is, it's a relief. Now, however, we can get deeper into the movement here and start taking off both the barrel bridge and the train wheel bridge. Those are the two upper plates that you see there. And that'll give us more information about how far the water got into the watch. So let's take off the barrel bridge first and see what we're looking at underneath here. Hopefully there's not much in the way of rusting. Okay, that's not too bad. You can see the top of the barrel, that's the big brass circle there, it looks pretty good. We'll take off the, ooh. Ooh, okay. Okay, well, we can see that the water definitely got to that side of the barrel. There's huge chunks of rust just floating around in here, and that's gonna need to be cleaned up. It looks like there's rust down into where the barrel meets that plate as well, and that is bad. So. Unfortunately, it does look like the water made its way through that part of the movement. So we'll have to address that. Okay, now we can take off the train wheel bridge and see what's going on under there. Is there rust? Uh, ooh, ooh, okay. So the center wheel won't move at all. It's rusted solid. So that's why the movement wasn't running at all that and, and everything else you see. But if the center wheel can't turn, then, you know, the, the watch won't run and it won't tell time. So we're going to have to remove that. We'll see how rusted in it actually is here. Oh boy, that is pretty firm. So it looks like that's where the water ended up coming through the most. We can continue with the disassembly. I want to uh, be a little careful about how to remove that center wheel. It's it's going to be a lost cause. Like I'm not planning on using it um, with that much rust on it. It's just going to have to be replaced. But I I want to just make sure that I'm careful about how I remove it so that ooh, there's a lot of rust. Yeah, uh, so that it doesn't damage the the main plate. Continue disassembling here. It looks like the pallet fork also dodged the water, which is another. Lucky thing, because again, the pallet fork has very fine parts on it that can easily just rust away. So even though the water did get pretty deep into the case, it looks like it's hit a bunch of the bigger parts, which is kind of what you would want. All right, so now let's take off the center wheel. I'm gonna use my tweezers to kind of carefully get underneath it and try to wedge it out if it'll come out. Yeah, it looks like it's starting to give just a little bit. If that's the case, then I should be able to remove it. Give it a gentle twist and there it comes right out. So that actually wasn't too bad. I mean, it was completely rusted solid, but taking it out wasn't the worst. You can see there's a lot of rust and debris around that hole as well. And now on my bench. <laughs> so this is what it's like to work on a, a rusty watch. I, I actually have experience doing this. So this isn't my first time working on one. In fact, you've seen me do them on the channel. I'm going to use a piece of pegwood here to try to knock off a little bit of the debris from the top of the screws that go onto the setting lever spring because they're very thin on the top and it looks like they've gotten pretty corroded. I'm going to have to examine those later to see if they're going to be reusable or not. But mainly, I want to make sure that I can get a bite on the screwdriver so that when I turn it, it doesn't just shear off the top of those screws. Yeah, taking off that setting lever spring, it looks like it's about done as well. And you can see some water got underneath the minute wheel and the intermediate wheel as well. Last few parts to take off before we have this thing completely disassembled. The yoke, there's a setting lever, and now the yoke spring. <sighs> Deep breath. This is stressful. Um, you can see there's quite a bit of rust, but look at this. This is more like staining rather than like active rust, like that's eating away at the metal. And that's a good thing. Um, so I might be able to clean that up without having to replace the main plate. I'm gonna take off these screws. It looks like these were replaced because there actually is a clamp on these, but that's not how Rolex does it. 
So these would have been replaced over some period of time. So I'll probably have to replace them again. Now I can take apart the automatic winding works. It's like its own little setup. There's a little bridge and you can see there's those three wheels underneath it. But this should come, across, come apart fine. And outside of a little bit of staining on the bottom of the rotor, you can see on that outside curved part, this doesn't look like the water really got to it. So this looks like it's all fine. Just, just in need of a service is all. Yeah, right here. And you can see that comes off with just a, a plastic stick there. So that that's no big deal. Now, I'm not gonna worry about that part either. Now I can take apart the, uh, whoa, 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 the spring. And it looks like it's okay, it's okay. It was just uh, probably jammed up because, well, I think it's because of this. <laughs> so the arbor is actually stuck in the lid and I think it pulled the spring out with it. And the reason it's stuck, it's rusted. That's right. How many times have I said that word already this video? Uh, so I'm going to try to just push it out and there it goes. So that's the arbor and it looks like it's toast as well as it took the brunt of that water on the other side of the movement. So, okay. Where are we at? These parts here, these are going to need to be replaced. That's too much rust, I think, um, you know, to, to be able to keep it. And uh, so we're going to have to replace at least those and then see what we've got coming down the line here. Taking a look at the case, the crystal looks like it's pretty scratched up, but otherwise in good shape. I talked to the owner and she said she'd prefer to keep the original crystal if possible, but would like it restored. So I think I'll do that. I'll restore this crystal rather than trying to get a new one. Now we can put everything in little baskets and such so that we can give it, well, let's just say it's first run through the watch cleaning machine. With, with this type of rust, it's common that it takes more effort to get it properly cleaned rather than just doing it through run one cycle on the watch cleaning machine. But this is a good place to start. So everything goes into this basket and uh, then we can put it into the watch cleaning machine and get it going. So here it is. This is a three-stage cleaning process. That initial one, is just the cleaning and then there's two rinses and a drying cycle after that. While it uh, gets cleaned up, I did wanna mention, I've got a Patreon for this channel. It's patreon.com slash, slash wristwatch revival. I wanna give a big thank you to everybody who supports me over on the Patreon. If you like videos like this, and this is the type of thing that you wanna see uh, come out and be supported, that's the place to do it. Um, and you even get a cool sticker and thank you card in the mail, no matter what level you sign up for. Okay, so out of the cleaning machine, you can see that there's still a lot of rust and this is gonna need to be manually cleaned. So I'm gonna take, I don't know, half an hour, 45 minutes with my peg wood here and just go through and manually de-rust this the best I can. And this will let me see what is rust rust and what is more like rust staining. And there is a big difference between the two. And then what we'll do is we'll clean this base plate again. And after about 45 minutes or so, I would say, this looks pretty decent. I was able to get this thing mostly cleaned up and uh, you know, I'm gonna go ahead and, and the parts that I think I can salvage like this minute wheel here, I'm just gonna run them through Rotico, get them cleaned up. And then what, what I'll do is I'll do a separate cleaning cycle for those in the ultrasonic cleaner as well to make sure that they're you know debris free. Now we can take off the winding stem. And when I took it out, I noticed that it was also rusted. So it's got enough rust on it that I'm gonna put it in the Evaporust. This is a, a product that um, removes rust. It, it turns it into some other, somebody's explained it to me in the comments before, but basically it takes rust and, and uh, turns it into something else that just sort of falls away. So now with all the parts out of the cleaning machine, uh, I can put them you know, in the dust tray. I've left the balance out as well. I'm gonna clean that separately um, just to be extra careful with it, basically. And you know, we put the parts in these, in these dust trays so that we can keep them. Here's the balance being clean. This is called One Dip, it's a solution. And I can use just an air blower here to agitate the solution around it. And uh, that'll get the, make, make sure that the balance is properly cleaned up and uh, just giving it a little bit of extra special attention here just because this watch is, uh, you know, in kind of bad shape. Okay, so I'll set that aside. Now this is the ultrasonic cleaner. So we can put the case 
uh, the bracelet, that type of stuff in here. I'm just going to go ahead and give it an initial run through. The ultrasonic cleaner sends waves through the water and it has a little bit of solution. And by the way, there's the parts that I de-rusted as well that are going to get their second cleaning. And what it does is um, those waves go through the water or whatever liquid you use and they remove dirt and debris without any type of abrasive. So, you know, for example, the bracelet in the case, you know, these things I'm going to be keeping original on this watch, but there's no reason not to clean them, right? Uh, especially with the bracelet, because if you have a, a dirty bracelet, it actually can create an abrasive in between the links. And what can happen is over time, that can lead to a looser bracelet. All right, everything out of the ultrasonic now. We can take a quick look at the case once again. And as you can see, the crystal definitely needs some work. Um, you know, this was a well-worn, well-used watch, and it shows. Uh, so we'll look at uh, restoring the crystal. And then as I mentioned before, the case, oh, it's got this beautiful wear on it, and I'm not going to be touching that thing. So in order to remove the bezel, I got this tool. <laughs> I wanted to be able to safely do it. And uh, this just basically lets those four clamps come in and remove the bezel itself. And you'll see it separate out from the case here as I clamp it down. If you try to do it from one side, you can warp or bend things or damage them. And you know, I don't have any interest in that. So there you go. You can see the bezel coming off and this will give us access to the crystal by itself so that I can actually work on the crystal and also to make sure that I clean up everything else that's underneath this, because sometimes there can be some dirt or debris under the bezel. Let's see what this looks like. Yeah, there's some dirt under there. You can see it. Nothing too bad. The ultrasonic looks like it did a decent job, but we'll run it through the ultrasonic cleaner again just to uh, get any of that debris off of there. In the meantime, I can take the crystal out, and we can put our attention to restoring the crystal. Now, these are made of acrylic which is a really amazing material. It's quite hard and uh, very resilient, but it does scratch, you know, it, it's not as hard as glass or sapphire. So uh, we will uh, want to resurface this. Again, you can buy a new one. The crystals for these are very expensive and very, very hard to find. Um, so this is a better option. And I'm going to use my sanding sticks, I'm starting off at a fairly fine grit compared to what I might normally use sand something like this. And what we're gonna do is remove just enough material so that the scratches, the deepest of the scratches are gone. And then we'll move up the grits, maybe two more, and then we'll finish off with a liquid polish called Poly Watch. So first thing, uh, we can take a look to see how it's doing. I've, there we go. So you can see it's obviously fogged up, but the scratches are mostly gone. And now I can do the edge and then work my way up through the sanding sticks until I get to a place where I'm happy with it. And uh, then, as I mentioned, we'll finish with the liquid polish, the poly watch. And you can see it looks pretty good uh, already, but it does need that sort of final polish to make it really, really shine nice and clear. And uh, so here we go. This is poly watch. And then I just made a little stand here out of Rotico so that I could put some pressure on the crystal and not have it feel like I'm bending it or, you know, could crack it or something like that. So again, just give it a good polish down here with the poly watch. And after, well, you know, good five, six minutes of that, take a look at what we came up with. Beautiful. Just like new almost. So the deep scratches are all gone. It's nice and crystal clear and that'll do just fine. Taking a quick look after the ultrasonic cleaning, the second cleaning for this movement, you can see the jewels look very nice. They're in good shape. They're clean. There's no rust debris or anything like that floating around in there, and I'm quite happy with the movement there. Unfortunately, for some of the parts, the rust is just too bad here, and these are gonna need to be replaced. This is a setting lever spring, as you can see. It has some of that staining, but also some legit corrosion. And this is also gone. That's a center wheel that was rusted into place. There's the arbor. And I'll just show you what a new one looks like next to it, just so you can see. <laughs> That's what it's supposed to look like. And of course, that one's uh, gone as well. I'm also going to take a quick look at the winding stem that I put in the Evapa Rust. You can see it did a great job of removing the rust. But unfortunately, the rust did a great job of removing some material from this stem. The threads you can see at the top are smaller, and then there's some uh, from the base that's also gone. So I'm going to replace this thread rather than uh, use it. I don't want to risk it breaking, right? Like that's a really annoying thing to happen. 
So I'm gonna just replace that as well. Okay, now we can get underway with the reassembly and see if we can't get this watch running again. We've got a lot of work to do on this thing still, but uh, hopefully it, it will run with the addition of some new parts, some lubrication, some cleaning, and some de-rusting. We'll start off with the mainspring and uh, since this is an automatic watch, I'm using what they call braking grease around the inside of the barrel. This is where that spring will slide around and rub up against the barrel. And uh, the braking grease lets it have the appropriate amount of friction so that it can stop sliding, or if it does slide, that it doesn't start tearing off material from the inside of the barrel. So just a little bit will do. Now I can take the mainspring winders to, to safely put that mainspring back into the barrel. You take the handle and then you pick the size that you think is right and yeah, that looks about right. Then you attach it to the front. This is a very much a specialty tool. It's only good for one thing, but it is quite necessary when you're putting back together a bunch of watches. Now I can put the mainspring on the winder here and then I can wind it into the winder and then I can use the winder to place it back safely into the barrel. And you just need to make sure that this outer part is uh, safely wound in as well. Just like that. Okay, now I can take off the winding handle and that'll leave the spring in the tool and ready for me to put it back into the, uh, the barrel. This is one of my favorite parts. <laughs> and that's why right there, I love that sound. It's a great feeling. And now you can see the spring is back in there and safe. Now I can put the brand new barrel arbor in place as well and a little bit of lubrication on the top here for where it meets up with the lid, which I will now put on using this little tool. Rolex Explorer is an absolute icon. You know, this is the watch. This uh, a version of that watch was the one that was worn on the first time that uh, Mount Everest was summited, right? This is kind of one of their claims to fame. And it's also a watch that's been in production continuously since then. You can, you can buy them now, theoretically. Okay, we'll start with the train of wheels here as we bring our, begin our reassembly. I have to say I'm really impressed with uh, how well this movement held up to that rust. This is a brand new center wheel, by the way. Tracking down parts is the hard part a lot of times when it comes to um, repairing vintage watches. This is likely why uh, both the jeweler and Rolex turned down. The customer in this case was because of parts availability. You can find them. I found most of them on eBay. You have to have patience. You have to know what you're looking for and you have to be willing to pay. Just as an example, just that center wheel that I put in was $120 for just the center wheel. That's a genuine Rolex one, but like, wow. Okay, now we can put the train wheel bridge on and try to get all the pivots lined up. Delicate operation. There we go. Okay. Oh, did it fall in? Let's see if it'll, it'll spin. Oh, sweet. Hey, this is why Rolex are great. One of the many reasons. They, they kind of are misunderstood now. Rolex is as a, as a brand. I think that most people think of them as like a luxury brand now, like a high, you know, a high end luxury brand. And to be fair, they have pushed in that direction. So I don't blame people for thinking that, but that is not what they were. Uh, that's not how they built their brand. They built it by making really tough, really durable sports watches, just like this one, the, you know, the owner's dad who wore this watch every day, I showed you those photos. 
right? I mean, this guy was riding mountain bikes and running triathlons and stuff like that in this watch. That's what these things were made for. They were made for climbing mountains and swimming in the ocean and doing that kind of stuff. And that isn't the type of thing that you normally associate with high luxury, right? That you'd think more like gold or dress watches or something like that. And this to me is the absolute beating heart of what Rolex is actually about, which is awesome over-engineered watches. And I mean that as a compliment that you can wear every single day and do basically anything in. And that's why this is one of my favorite models because this one kind of exemplifies that for me. Okay, so as we work our way through here, the barrel bridge goes on, click, click spring, click screw going on. And now we can put the ratchet wheel on as well. There we go, make sure that it's seated correctly. It looks like everything's spinning freely as far as the train wheel goes, so that's that's a good news as well. Okay, so there's the ratchet wheel in place, and now we can put the crown wheel in place. It has a few parts to it. It's got this kind of washer at the bottom, then this outer ring with the teeth on it, and then an inner ring that uh, screws down to the plate via two screws. That part actually has three screw holes on it. You can see the one in the middle, and I'll show you later what that one's for. That one actually doesn't secure it to the plate. This one does though. Okay, now flipping the movement over, we can start to rebuild the other side. This is what they call the dial side of the movement. The dial sits on this part. A little bit of oil on the, on the barrel where it meets that bridge just to make sure that it's nicely lubricated. Now I can put on the new uh, cannon pinion like that. Also, before I put on the minute wheel, I'll just oil this jewel really quick. We'll, we'll oil the rest of the jewels later, but this one's gonna be covered up. So I just wanna get that out of the way now. Okay, and now we can turn our attention to the keyless works. This is called the keyless works because if you have ever seen a very old pocket watch, they have a little key on them that you use to wind up and set the watch. And you used to have to carry that with you, like attach it to the watch or have it in another pocket. And when they invented this method of setting and winding the watch, where you use the crown on, on the top of a pocket watch or on the side of a wristwatch in this case, they called it the keyless works because you don't need a key. <laughs> now that's funny because for us, I, you know, I never had a watch that needed a key outside of a, an antique, but uh, for them, it was like, Everybody was used to using a key, so now they advertise it as the keyless works. Okay, putting in the new winding stem, it doesn't wanna go in all the way though, and I think there's a little bit of corrosion perhaps on the tube there where that goes in. So I'm gonna take a, a brooch, this is a smoothing brooch, and it allows me to very gently smooth out and open up that hole there, and let's see if that worked. Yeah, so that fits now. So there was some some rust or corrosion on the inside of that tube, and that's why it wouldn't go in. Yeah, I'm not surprised though, right? Like we're gonna run into problems like that with a watch like this. When it's been exposed to, to seawater, I mean, that's the worst possible thing, right? Like it corrodes um, metal and inside of a movement, you know, there's very small pieces of stainless steel, also brass, you know, so stuff that can be really susceptible to corrosion. So... That's just part of the deal, but uh, you know our job here is to try to make the very best of this that we can. Okay, now we can put the setting lever in. I've already put in the, uh, the yoke as you just saw, as well as the yoke spring. And now I can put in our brand new setting lever spring. And taking a quick look at the setting lever spring screws, if you remember, these are the ones that I was worried about that corrosion on the top. And look, they're quite badly corroded. It's just black on top of that screw. So I'm gonna restore these. And the way I'm gonna do it is I'm gonna put them in a pin vise and then I'm gonna sand them. 
I'm going to do this gently, right? I don't want to go overboard with this, but that I don't want that corrosion on there. And take a look at it now. See how this top of the screw is nice and shiny? That's all I wanted to do is just to get them back to that state so that there wasn't still rust on them when I put them back in. It also let me see how well the screw heads held up to that corrosion. They actually did pretty good. Okay. So that's looking fine. I can now lubricate the rest of the keyless works. I'm using this blue grease. That's like the heavy duty grease that we use in watchmaking. By regular grease standards, it's not actually very heavy duty at all, but by watch standards, it's the, the thickest grease that we use. Okay, now we're getting down the stretch and I can put in the pallet fork and then the balance. And then we're gonna see if this thing's gonna run. I have to say I have not felt so emotionally invested in a watch. Working on somebody else's watch carries a level of responsibility with it. And after I heard the story of what happened to the watch and who it belonged to and all that stuff, I can't help but, you know, really want this thing to, to run. Quick check of the pallet fork. Yep, power's coming down the pipe. So here we go. Let's put the balance in and see if we can't get this watch running again. Please run. Okay. Get the balance wheel seated. Oh, there it goes. There it goes. The watch is running again. Fantastic. Oh, after being exposed to rust, it lives again. Oh, and I'm so relieved. <laughs> It's funny. It's usually I just feel happiness when I see one of these going excitement and I feel relieved to see this one going. Now, taking a look at the dial, I noticed something. So this is what we call a dial foot. This is what goes into the movement and secures it. But look at the other side. The other dial foot has corroded off. It's gone. It um, was stuck in the movement. I was able to, to get that piece out, but that's not going to do. We have to fix it. And this is what a new dial foot looks like. There's actually three options. You can use what's called a dial dot, which is like glue. I'm not going to use that. You can use soldering, which I'm not going to do on this watch. I'm not going to introduce heat to this dial, or you can do the method that I'm going to do now. And that is to replace it with a replacement dial foot. So in order to do this properly, we have to do something very, very, very stressful. So I have to put this dial into a, a holder. And what needs to happen is we need to mill away with this little mill tool, 0.1 of a millimeter of the back of the dial so that that new dial foot has a recess to sit in so that the dial can still sit flat. And this is extraordinarily stressful working on such a valuable, important watch. Um, and taking material off the back of the dial. But I did extensive research and this is the best method that I found to do it. So this is what I mean. See how that dial foot has a little base? If you secure that to the back of the dial directly, it will stick up too far. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna use my screwdriver, excuse me, my tweezers here to score. You just put a bunch of scratches in both where it's gonna sit and then also the bottom of the dial foot and I'm gonna use some epoxy to secure it. And again, this, is, this isn't this is fun. I, I, I won't lie to you. This is legitimately stressful stuff to work on such a valuable watch and have to do you know these type of things. What I ended up doing was practicing on a junk movement or a junk dial over and over again. I did maybe five or six of those so that I could get a good feel for how that uh, mill press thing worked. So I felt pretty comfortable, but still it's like you just hold your breath. So now I can take some of this epoxy and put it into place here on the back of the dial where the new dial foot's gonna go. And now I can put it into place. And what I want is for the base of the dial foot to go into that hole that I put. Again, it's a tenth of a millimeter deep. It's not much. Now we'll let it dry. And when I come back, we can take a look at it. So the epoxy has now dried and I've got another tool that I can use. This is a, 
a little hand mill. And what I can do is put this around the post and then turn it because as if you notice, there's a little bit of the epoxy that kind of bumps up, you know, it gets displaced when you put it down and then it dries. And I want this dial to be able to sit flush. So I'm going to use that to remove the excess epoxy. And then I can just clip off the top. The dial foot's a little bit too long as it sits. So I'll just remove that just like that. And then I can just take a file to remove any burr that's on it just so that it doesn't have a rough edge on it. Again, just being really gentle here. This is the type of repair that will last the rest of the watch's life versus if you use the sticky dial dots where they dry up at some point and then you have that and a quick check. Yeah, that feels very firm. And I think we're good to go here with that dial foot. So Oh, so we can breathe a sigh of relief and get back to work on the movement because of course we still need to get it lubricated properly. So this is Mobius 9010. That's a certain type of oil that goes onto these jeweled pivots here at the top. Just a little tiny bit. That's why I like to do it on the microscope. I mean, I like to do it because I can show you, uh, you know, what I'm doing, but also it lets me be a bit more precise with it. It's always uh, something that you know, in my mind, you have to practice, you know, like I feel like I've never quite mastered it perfect, but I'm uh, getting better and better every time. We can also take off these capsules. They have a little runner on them. And then what needs to happen with these is this part needs to be cleaned in a solvent. And then usually there'll be some dried on oil that you'll want to remove manually. And then you replace the oil. It kind of sits suspended on that part and then you replace it back onto the watch and it just holds oil exactly above that friction point and uh, it lets it last longer that way and stay better lubricated. So it's really a great system. And you can see I'm going to put just a little dot of oil right in the center of the bottom of that capsule. There we go. And then what I can do is take the capsule, gently flip it over. And now I can re reinstall it back in. And watch what happens when I put it into place. Do you see that circle of oil in the middle? It's like a round part. That's suspended oil directly above the pivot. And that's exactly what we want to see. And then I can gently put this spring back into place. This one's on the uh, escape wheel. Just like that. And then this one's on the top of the balance. There's also one of these on the bottom of the balance and there's ones on the bottom of the escape wheel, but I'm gonna show you a few of them. This one's actually a two part setting. So when I take this out, in fact, you can see it actually came in half there. So that's the top capsule. It's the same as the one that I just removed, but this one actually has a full setting. So if you look, there we go. I can use some Rotico, that little putty stuff to take off the other half of the setting. And then I'll clean both of these once again in the uh, solvent. just like that. And that'll once again, remove any oil or debris that's on there. And now I can do the same procedure again. I put a tiny drop of oil in the middle, then I replace the setting just like this. And now I can put it back into the watch. And again, the idea is that it suspends the oil directly above the pivot. And ooh, Oh, that doesn't look right. Okay, so take a look at how the oil's sitting underneath that cap. It should be a circle like the other one, and it kind of looks like a like a shoehorn, a, a horseshoe or something like that. You know, it's not the right shape. So what I have to do is start over again. So take it out, put it back in the one dip, put that drop of oil in, and then redo it again. Let's see how it looks this time. There we go. Now we've got a nice little circle of oil right in the middle, and that's exactly what we want. Those little details matter. You know, it'll, if, if the oil's not sitting in the center like that, then it can run out the sides. It can get dry and not work properly. Let's see how this watch is running after being lubricated. Hey, that's pretty good. Plus four seconds, plus two seconds a day. The amplitude's a little on the low side at 209, but I figure with what this watch has been through, I'm not super shocked by that. I'm now going to take out the rubber gasket that goes on the crown tube. Again, this is where the water ended up getting into the watch. So it's always good to replace those whenever you do a service, um, just to, you know, give it a better chance of having water resistance. In general, watches like this that were designed to be made waterproof originally will actually hold up pretty well, but won't hold up to the specifications that they had when they were first made. So what I recommend for watches like sport watches like this is if the 
gaskets have been replaced and all that type of stuff, then you can wear it. You can wear it if it rains, you can wash your hands in it, it's okay. What I don't recommend is taking in the shower or going swimming on these expensive vintage watches because you really don't know unless you do like a full pressure test how waterproof it is. And it's very difficult for these very old watches that have kind of seen a lot of action to uh, to be fully water resistant like they once were. So I, I would recommend playing it a little on the safer side, but not to the point that you don't feel like you can wear your watch for just day to day stuff. You know, just take it off if you jump in the pool. Okay, so now we can continue with putting the top part of this movement back together. This is the center seconds pinion and the extended center seconds wheel here. So I'm just gonna use my hand press tool to put this back on. It seems like it would be the right size. Yeah, there we go. And now, if you remember on top of the crown wheel, I mentioned there was that center screw hole. This is actually what it's for. It just holds this little this spring in place that keeps the um, center seconds pinion in place. And when I say center seconds pinion, what I mean is this watch has a seconds hand that sits in the middle like most watches. And this little thing that I'm screwing down puts tension on the actual thing that that hand sits on so that it rides smooth and so that it doesn't fall out of place. It's a very thin spring. It's, it feels almost like you know foil or something like that. Okay, now we can put the case back together as well. And that means that uh, we're gonna use our rover press to do that. So remember, it's the case, the crystal, and then the bezel that goes around the crystal. And we need to press that back into place as well. So there's the case. And there's our restored crystal, looking good. And now I can put the bezel on. And then I can use a die that presses just around the outer part of that bezel and gently click it back into place. Just like that. That's one of the ways that um, these watches were water resistant as well. And take a look, the case looks really nice. Again, no polishing done on it, no, no work on the case at all. That was, this is very much gonna be left in the condition that it was in when the owner's father had it. And that's, I think, awesome. That's the way to do it for sure. And then if you remember that little gasket that I took out uh, just a minute ago, this is the new one. I put it in this silicone uh, d that makes it a little more supple and puts a little bit more waterproofing on it. And then I can just gently put it back into place and there it is. So that's a brand new one of those. And then there's also one that'll go on the back of the watch here as well, like that. And I'm gonna do the same thing using this little speed lubricator thing. It, it um, cleans it so that there's no, there's no like uh, dust or debris on the gasket, which gives it a better chance to have a seal. And then, like I said, it puts that silicone grease on it as well. Okay. These are brand new case screws. Again, the other ones, they had been replaced and they rusted out. So we're going to go back to original Rolex ones this time. And this is the hour wheel going in. This is going to set us up so that we can put the dial and the hands back on. Speaking of, here's the dial. And this is also a good chance to see if that dial foot's working properly and it looks like it's sitting well. And with that in place, it means that we can put the hands back on too. There's the hour hand going on. And this watch doesn't have a date function, which is by the way, one of the things I really like about it. It keeps the dial symmetrical and clean, and I like that look. Um, but it also means that I can put the hour, the, the hands on whichever, as long as it's on the hour, it's fine. And this is the second hand that I was just talking about going on, being pressed onto that pinion. And now we can put the case on as well. And once again, we just have to rotate the movement in the case until it lines up properly with the side. And that also means that we can now put on the automatic winding works again, make sure that they're engaged properly. And then there's three screws that hold it into place. Rolex has a word for automatic, they call it a perpetual. 
And now we can put in the whiny sun, but as you can see, it's far too big. That's because it's brand new, so it needs to be trimmed down to size. So we'll do that as well. This is something that happens when you do replace a bunch of parts on a watch. And you can measure it up and then mark it with a marker, and then you can clip it off. And what you generally want to do is leave yourself a little bit of wiggle room there. And then you can use a file to deburr it to make sure it doesn't have any sharp edges. And then you can also use a file to uh, reduce its length by small amounts if that's what you need to do. This is uh, Loctite. If you've worked in uh, automotive industry or a lot of industries, a lot of places use Loctite. This is a what they call a thread locker. You put it on a thread of a screw and then you screw it in and then it dries and it holds it in place. The one that we use for watches like this is actually the weakest of the thread lockers. You don't want it to permanently stay that way. You want to be able to take that out again if needed, but um, this will keep it uh, from coming unscrewed just accidentally. And it looks like that's all ready to go. And now we can put the case back on the watch as well. And we are in the home stretch of what was probably the hardest restoration that I've done. This was a non-running rusted Rolex and now it is back in action. And I gotta say, this is one of the best feelings you can get from this hobby is bringing something like this back to life and then getting a chance to deliver it to the owner. Um, I honestly am honored just to have been able to work on a watch like this that was so important and so valuable um, in many ways, not just monetary, but also uh, other ways. And uh, I'm thrilled with how this watch came out. Um, again, this is one of my absolute favorites, and uh, I can't believe that I got to work on it, and I can't believe that it's back in action. There it is on the wrist of the owner as I gave it back to her and her lovely little dog, Maggie, as well. Um, looks good, right? That's what you want to see. And there it is uh, out in the wild as well. What a journey this one was. Uh, definitely the most stressful restoration I've done, but also the most rewarding. I'm really grateful that you were able to come along with me for this one. And I want to thank you for taking the time to do so. Um, I do have an Instagram for this channel. If you're interested in catching up on in-between project updates or some of the watches for my collection, you can go over to wristwatch underscore revival on Instagram. Other than that, I just wanted to reiterate my thanks to you for hanging out with me and going on this journey. I can't wait to see you next time. We'll see you then.